a garbage in, garbage out. Who grew up with that saying? Anybody else? Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. Maybe you grew up with that saying in terms of the content you were consuming. Like we had very strict rules on what music we could listen to in our home growing up. Or maybe now as a grown up, you use it to be like, garbage in, garbage out. I want a sweet treat, but I'm going to be disciplined and reach for fruit instead of ice cream. You know, it works. But we know all around nature, we see this to be true, garbage in, garbage out. If we pollute things, then the what grows is going to be stunted or barren or just <laughs> not growing at all. The saying rings true, garbage in, garbage out. We're going to be digging into 1 Timothy 4 today. And my best way that I can describe 1 Timothy 4 is it feels a little bit like a load of sheets tossed into the dryer. Have you ever had to take a load of sheets out of the dryer? It's the most frustrating thing. Because if you put anything small in there, uh, like they're all tangled up anyway, but then you have like a wet sock, you know, that was like stuck in the pocket of that fitted sheet. Am I the only one who launders sheet? Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, you understand. It's this like jumbled kind of mess that of these separate things that are so interwoven that it takes forever, unless you guys all have a system that I don't have. Tell me in the lobby. Of these things are so interwoven that they can barely be pulled apart. And the bottom line of 1 Timothy 4 is that we need to be careful of both the input and the output of our lives. Garbage in, garbage out. And I think of all of 1 Timothy 4 can actually be summarized in this part of verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Because the reality is none of us are immune. None of us are immune to this pole of false theology, which just is a big word for saying a false way of viewing who God is and how he interacts with humanity. None of us are immune to the tug of apathy that leads us to falling away from our faith. None of us are immune to our humanity and sinfulness. We are all capable of living in this warning of chapter four. We are all capable of falling into the trap of garbage in, garbage out. So let's read this chapter together and then we're going to dive in. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Well, there's no arguing Paul's opening point. There's nothing new under the sun. 
We've seen it all. We've seen the people that we love and have journeyed with in faith fall away, turn away from that faith. We've heard the stories. We've watched it. We've proved his words to be true just in those that we know. And it's why input matters so greatly because the gospel that you were saved under will color everything out, everything else about your Christian experience. Think about it. If you were saved under a gospel that said, if Jesus loves you, he will bless you. And those blessings are things that are tangible and quantifiable. Then what happens when we walk through devastation? What is the opposite of that false truth? Well, if it seems like blessing is being stripped away from my life and God blesses those he loves, then he must not love me. If you are saved under a gospel that says you have to attain a certain level of holiness for God to hear your prayers, then what happens when we stumble and fall? When we have those moments where our sinfulness comes to the forefront and we trip up, what's the opposite of that false truth? Constant distance with God. Because we're never going to hit that level of perfection. The beliefs that we hold matter. The input matters. And Paul's warning Timothy, watch for the sources of input in your church. And by extension, he warns us, watch for the sources of input in your life and in our church. Where are we holding on to false beliefs about God and how he interacts with us? And where do they come from? Well, verse 1 tells us we have an enemy who's a master at deception. He's the father of lies. He's called that in John 8, 44. We do have an enemy who loves to twist lies so that they look like truth. And we're warned that in doing so, he will lead many astray. We also have those in verse 2 who have rejected the discipline of God for so long that their consciences are actually seared. They have rejected the discipline of God for so long that they have believed their own lies and the eye, the lies of the enemy, and they no longer have the ears to hear and understand error. Their hearts are hardened. Their consciences are seared. And then we have the input of just the foolishness of humanity in verse 7 of believing what feels right with no basis in the word of God. And this is the one I find so interesting because we do it all the time. Like who has ever went to like swallow a piece of gum and stopped and then had to be like, it's okay to actually swallow your gum. Anybody? Why do you do it? Because once upon a time, someone told you an old wives tale. And they said it would take seven years for your body to digest that gum, which is just bunk. But we do it. If we do it in our actual lives, how easy is it for those same kinds of beliefs to funnel their way into our faith? Those things that may seem right, they might even have some evidence, but they're foolish because they're, they're made with our human logic. And what's the mark of this twisted input? Legalism. We see the output in verse 3 is there's this restriction that doesn't make any sense. There's this arbitrary rejection of the good gifts of God that makes no sense. Because the input was wrong. William Barclay writes, The true Christian does not serve God by enslaving himself with rules and regulations and insulting his creation. He serves him by gratefully accepting his good gifts and remembering that this is a world where God made all things well. And by never forgetting to share 
God's gifts with others. It's this devastating reality that there are those who are living with the wrong input. And they believe it so much that they're wrapped up in bondage, believing it's freedom. And because what they are living is actually bondage, they yearn for release from it. And there are those who are going to fall away from their faith just because they're learning from the wrong input. So watch your life and doctrine closely because none of us are immune. We need to be monitoring our input. We need to be those who are studying the word of God for ourselves, who are spending time in the presence of Jesus. I was scrolling through social media this week through Instagram, and a pastor that I follow, Jada Edwards, had just a little clip from a Bible study she was teaching. And she was talking on false teachers, but not from 1 Timothy. And she is saying, if we only know this much about who God is, this much of the word of God, then false teachers only actually need to know this much to lead us astray. They only need to know this much more than we do to present a convincing argument of something that is almost true, but will lead us to bondage believing it's freedom. And that will make us yearn to be released from it. But there's another input that Paul holds up for Timothy in verses 13 to 15. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them. There's another input because we have the Holy Spirit who's living and active, who brings this book, the word of God to life for us. The one who makes this living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We have the Holy Spirit who uses his people in community to sharpen one another to hold each other accountable to theological error. We have the Holy Spirit who gives us an input into our lives that will always be sound and true. Matthew Henry writes, it's not enough that we refuse profane and old wives' fables, but we must exercise ourselves to godliness. We must not only cease to do evil, but we must learn to do well. And we must make a practice of exercising ourselves to godliness. Because there will be an input. <laughs> we are all receiving input into our lives. It's not enough to just say, I'm not going to follow that input. We have to choose the input that we do receive. Garbage in, garbage out. But health in, truth in, life in, grace in, the same out. There's another way and we must prioritize it. But before we dive into the outcomes, because input, garbage in, output, I want to use one of the outputs to highlight why input matters. And that's the output of conduct. And we see that in verse 12. And this is the Greek word anastrophe. Because as you just like kind of read through this list, it can be really easy to just give ourselves another to-do list of try harder living. But anastrophe is this thought idea of a change of outward behavior from an upturn of inner belief. It's this idea of conduct that happens as a result of a changed heart. Not just do better, Timothy. Not just make sure that your actions line up with what people think a good Christian young man should be. But are you spending enough time with Jesus that he's purifying your hearts, that your actions follow? If we don't have the right input, our output will become legalism. 
even if we think that it's right. If we don't understand this moment, like this anastrophe, then we will live in bondage believing it's freedom when that is not what Jesus asked us to do. We will become whitewashed tombs. We will become cups clean on the outside, but still filthy on the inside. Does that sound familiar? Like Jesus' warning to some of those Pharisees who did everything right, but whose hearts were still far from him? The input matters. Because the goal is not to live up to some checklist. Like Christian robots, we aren't. The goal is to have the output of our lives reflect the input. And in this case, to see Jesus on display in our words, actions, and attitudes. David Guzik writes, the word godliness that we get in our Bibles comes from the Old English word godlikeness. It means to have the character and attitude of God. And so Paul kind of gives Timothy this jumbled up sheet kind of moment in 1 Timothy where he has all these different places where there's this false teaching and this error. And then he has all of these places where his outcome is tied to either embracing or rejecting those things. And the thing that I found really interesting in this is that part of this list that Paul gives to Timothy, Timothy has absolutely no control over. He can't do it on his own. There's a surrender, a choice, and a progression that's part of Paul's encouragement to him and by extension to us. The first is surrender. As I said, there's this part of this list to Timothy that he can't create in himself. The very top of that list is love, and this isn't just any love. It's agape love or unconditional love. There's absolutely no way that Timothy on his own could love people with no strings attached. No way. I look at the people who I love most in the world, the people that without hesitation I would die for. And my love for them is flawed. There's no way that Timothy, in his own strength or in his own choosing, could get to that kind of love. It had to be through the Holy Spirit. Or this conduct, this anastrophe that comes from our beliefs falling in line with absolute truth. There is nothing that we can do in our own strength to change our thoughts. We can take them captive, but we don't have the power to change them. Only the Holy Spirit at work in our minds and our lives can do it. It requires a deep work of the Holy Spirit. And so I find it so interesting that Paul gives Timothy this list of things that he should be doing. Hey, watch this in your life. Pay close attention to your life. You can't do it. Here you go. It requires surrender. It requires monitoring the input. And there's a stretching that comes when we need to allow God to work in our lives. There's a feeling of helplessness that comes when we have to surrender that I actually hate. I don't really like being helpless. I don't really like having to admit that I can't do something on my own. And there's an element of this that we are just going to have to get comfortable with. That we're going to have to confront and embrace being uncomfortable. We're going to have to confront and embrace a dying to our need for control. We're going to have to confront and embrace a dying to our desire for independence. We're going to have to confront and embrace a dying to timelines that fit us. There's a whole lot in surrender 
as lovely as we want to make it. I mean, it's so lovely to sing songs about surrender, and it feels like these beautiful moments. Surrender is war. It's not as easy. And so we choose. Timothy had to choose to walk in obedience. He had to choose to train in godliness. This is this in verse 10. That's why we labor and strive. Some translations are labor and struggle. Because we put our hope in the living God, who's the savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Yay. Right? That's great output. We had to labor and strive. And now I'm going to back up for a moment because I've talked a lot. Because striving is one of those things that I fall into a lot. So let me back up to my own definition of striving where we're working for God's love and approval. That is not what this striving is. The word for this striving in verse 10 is ag- agonizmahi. And it's kind of, again, kind of one of those thought definitions, as Greek usually is. It's, it's more of a thought than a singular word. And it's one who would be contending for a prize, where you're pressing on because there's something to be won at the end. There's a goal in mind, so you keep going. You keep running even though the cramps have started and you're feeling winded and you're exhausted beyond belief and everything in you just wants to lie down and quit. You keep going. That's what Paul is saying. It's going to require choice to have the kind of output that a godly life demands. It's going to require us to do the hard work to keep going when things get difficult. It's going to require us to choose faith when we have doubt. It's going to require us to choose purity when we're tempted. It's going to require us to choose community over isolation. To choose serving others when we really just want to be served. It's going to require choice. And finally, I thank God that he breathed this to Paul. It requires progression. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. William Barclay writes, he must remember the duty of progress. His progress must be evident to all men. It's all too true of most of us that the same things conquer us year in and year out. That is, year succeeds year. We're no further on. The Christian leader pleads with others to become more like Christ. How can he do so with honesty unless he himself, from day to day, becomes more like the master whose he is and whom he seeks to serve? It's both freeing and sobering. It's freeing because we'll never arrive. We're works in progress. There's grace for us. We can continue to run the good race. Even when we stumble, we can get back up, receive forgiveness, and continue on. And it's sobering because staying the same is not an option. Staying stagnant in our faith is not an option. There is a very intentional process, a very prayerful process, one of community when we put the words together for our mission statement. We want to be a safe place for everyone. Going on to the end. Look more and more like Jesus each day. It wasn't a pithy thought. It wasn't a, hey, this kind of sounds good. It's the gospel. The gospel is that we explore this faith in Jesus, we receive his love, and then we aren't able to stay the same. We look more and more like him each day. We must work out our salvation with fear and trembling because our lives are on display all the time, and so must be our progress. 
So watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is my second Sunday back, and many of you have asked how my sabbatical was. And if I'm really honest, the best word is it was painful. It was really painful, but like a good painful, like a needed surgery kind of pain. And not just because I missed you, and I don't say that lightly, I did so much, more than I have words to express. This is my faith community. And three months of pausing, being part of that, kind of felt like my heart was ripped out. And not just because I missed working, because, oh man, I so missed working. (laughs) Is because God, in his gentleness, knew that there are some things that we had to confront in my life that were going to take significant amounts of time. Watch your life and doctrine closely. See, I was holding this narrative of God so deeply buried in my heart that I didn't even know it was there. That it was coloring everything about my faith journey. The false narrative that I was holding so deep that if you had asked me, I would have emphatically said absolutely not, was that God was cruel. And what that meant for my faith journey was that while I desired more than anything to have this intimacy with God, I would get to a certain point with him and then go, that's close enough. And every time I'd feel that resistance, I would beat myself up. Like, what is wrong with you? How can you say that this is what you want more than anything? And then when you get there, you're like, um. It's because in my heart of hearts, I really didn't trust him. I didn't feel safe. And in this process of exploring this, What we discovered in this journey, God already knew he was helping me to unearth it, was that because I do believe God is sovereign, that in all of the places where I was deeply wounded, I held him accountable. For all the places where people had hurt me, I held him accountable. I didn't walk in bitterness or unforgiveness towards people. I saved that all for God. I held him responsible for the gift of free will. If you would ask me, why would a good God blank? I would have been able to answer you with probably the right verbal words (laughs) that I, like, brain logically believed to be true. And I wasn't lying. It was just so deep in my heart that I wasn't aware of it. I remember the first day that God just blew up my whole world and sitting and weeping for hours on my couch And saying to God, I don't know how to fix me. There's nothing I can do with this. Only you can do it. And I feel this same 
heart to Timothy from Paul. Timothy, there is so much that is vying for you to listen to it. From the evil of demonic influences to the foolishness of human ones. And if you're not true, or if you're not careful, you're going to pick up these false things. And they're going to take root so deep in your heart that it's going to impact everything else about your life. But it's not your weight to carry. You can't fix it. Only God can. Yours is just the choice to surrender, to pursue the things of God, and to keep growing. I ask the worship team to come back. I said it before I went on sabbatical, and I believe it even more now. What we believe about God matters. Because what we choose as our input affects our output. One of the lines that I heard at church I was going to online from one of my favorite teacher is Megan Marshman, was be willing to sit as long as it takes with Jesus to do what he needs to do in your life. If there are places where we've had the wrong input, that's not going to be a quick fix. If there are lies that we've held as truth, tearing up those weeds in the soil of our heart is going to be tedious and painful and timely. And we have a tendency to want to rush through to get the Coles Note version, but there's no rushing the deep work of the Spirit of God. And we have to be comfortable with the discomfort. We need to embrace the pain. We need to be willing to sit in those moments where we go, I hear you, but I don't know what to do with it. Because I can't fix it. I was trying to write this clean, neat, tidy way <laughs> to end this today because it's Thanksgiving. And some of you have turkeys in the oven. And my cursor just sat there at this point. And then last night, because I still am not sleeping super great, at two o'clock in the morning, having a conversation with God about, please let me sleep. That's all it was about. Please let me sleep. And he said, Lisa, there's never going to be a perfect time to respond and to wait. Because there's always going to be something we're supposed to rush off to. There's always going to be something in the metaphorical oven demanding our attention. There's always going to be something, kids that are antsy or to-do lists or important things that we need to do. And there's never going to be a perfect time, but there is a surrendered one where we choose. Where we say, I know. I know that this is going to be the start of unearthing something that's painful and it's not going to be fast and it's probably not going to be fixed today. But I'm in agreement with you. If you trust this is for my good, then let's begin. And friends, I would wager a bet that I'm not the only one 
who has beliefs about God that aren't true. So deep in your spirit that it affects how you interact with him. Life does that. And so I want to invite us that there will never be a perfect time, but right here, right now, this can be a surrendered one. And this can be the beginning of something that is painful, but for our good. Because he is good. And we can trust him. And yes, he's sovereign. He's also gentle. So God, in this moment, would you reveal what needs to be revealed for right now? You are too kind to us to throw all of our faults in our face at once. And you are too gracious to turn our whole world upside down at the same time. But you know what you want to confront right now. You know what we've been holding on to and listening to, believing it to be truth that was error and lie and falsehood. And so we embrace the discomfort of surrender. And we choose, if it's for our good, then let's begin. Have your way. We trust you. We trust you to unearth and to speak and to reveal and to replace. Because you are good in all your ways. Let's begin. In your precious name, Jesus. Thank you.